Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the program today, we have Jeff McCoy, Pacific Legal Foundation staff attorney. And we also have Daryl Clift, who is a 2014 candidate for uh, Solano <laughs> County Supervisor, running on a, a libertarian-ish, this was an independent race, right? Yes, it was. Libertarian-ish uh, ticket. Welcome to the show. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> Jeff, the, one of the big projects of uh, Pacific Legal right now which is a little bit of a different direction for PLF, is uh, basically unearthing and publicizing and encouraging the use of the Congressional Review Act, CRA, through uh, a website called redtaperollback.com and, and other means. You've been involved a little bit along, uh, in that along with uh, the, uh, our Washington, D.C. Uh, Executive Director, Todd Gaziano. Uh, tell us a little bit about what Red Tape Rollback and the CRA is all about. Well, the Congressional Review Act was a, a, a piece of legislation that was passed in 1996. It was designed to give Congress um, a chance to review and overturn uh, agency regulations. Um, up until now, though, it has only been used once to overturn um, a, a Clinton-era OSHA regulation. Um, but now, thanks to the help of uh, Todd Gaziano and the Pacific Legal Foundation, uh, DC office, um, there, it, the Congressional Review Act has kind of gotten a new life. Um, in the past, um, since the, the beginning of the Trump administration, Congress and the administration have overturned 13 regulations um, that were adopted late in the Obama administration. Um, many of these, uh, they, these regulations uh, cover a wide range of, of various um, aspects of people's lives. Uh, um, Regulations have made it harder to develop um, on public lands. Um, uh, some Department of Education regulations. Um, I think the most well publicized one that was overturned was a Social Security Administration um, regulation that would require background checks for certain disability recipients um, for before purchasing firearms. And so these regulations, um, uh, there's a. The, there is usually a 60-day window for uh, Congress, a 60-day legislative window um, to... In other words, uh, six months. Yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, about six months uh, to, to overturn regulations that have been reported to Congress. The Congressional Review Act uh, requires all agencies to, to send a report, a brief report about the costs to Congress. Um, one of the ideas that Todd Gaziano had though, is that because the Congressional Review Act says that a law, a regulation does not go into effect until it is sent, um, that there are probably, and we uh, we and our partner organizations, Pacific Legal Foundation and our partner organizations, have identified hundreds of regulations that have not been sent to Congress. So in other words, the agencies were essentially ignoring the CRA and saying, we're going to pass this regulation, we're going to ignore the CRA and not report the uh, regulation and its costs and, and, and effects and so forth to Congress and hope it flies under the radar and Congress has let that happen. Correct. And so one of the ideas that Todd had is that uh, the Trump administration can, can help uh, identify some of these regulations um, that have not been sent and either order the agencies to send them up um, and if when they're sent up the 60-day legislative clock will start running give Congress a chance to review all these regulations, all the way going back to 1996. Now, Todd was part of writing that uh, legislation as a congressional staffer back then, right? Yes, he, um, he was on the, the legislative staff for David McIntosh, who was the uh, a representative from Indiana at the time and was the co-sponsor of the Congressional Review Act. Um, and so Todd, um, and, and to, uh, to David McIntosh's credit, um, he always, he gives Todd a lot of credit in the writing of that bill. Um, uh, Todd tries to downplay his role, but uh, Todd was there um, on the front lines in, in writing that. Um, and so these, he, he has a different perspective on um, how this law came about, and it, it was his ideas that have been publicized. Um, the Wall Street Journal has run two interviews with him, um, and it is, and so there is an opportunity, even though the um, many media reports have said that the time for the Congressional Review Act is up because it's now been 60 legislative days um, since the end of the Obama administration. But because of those hundreds of regulations that were never sent, uh, the Congressional Review Act, uh, the Congress can still use the Congressional Review Act to roll back danger, uh, 
costly regulations. What are the regulations that have been rolled back that are of particular uh, interest to PLF? Well, like I said, there, there um, were several uh, regulations uh, that affect oil and gas development, uh, mineral development on, on public lands, and now- so, so regulations that made it more difficult to uh, do uh, development? Yes, and, and ultimately though, because um, these, these regulations were usually just um, superfluous and didn't really add any safety, but just added more compliance costs because they, there was another thing that these, um, these developers had to comply with. But because these industries are heavily regulated, both on the federal and state level, uh, the effects of these regulations, most of these regulations are just to increase compliance costs without any actual safety, health or safety benefit. Is um, it, is that the, was that the goal of the Obama administration, simply to raise costs so that uh, development wouldn't happen? Well, I, I don't know. I can't speak for what there there were. I think some people don't look at the the big picture, or uh, I think that in some um, some bureaucrats in Washington feel that only the federal government can can provide the adequate safety. Um, I think I, I I think it's especially in these agencies um, they get in their own bubble and feel like they have to do all the regulations and they don't understand all the the other regulations on the state and local level that are doing. Um, the inadequate adequate job of, of providing health and safety um, for various uh, for these various industries. What regulations uh, would you say are, are uh, in the crosshairs to be uh, reviewed next? Well, one that has been identified um, is uh, there. There is a a guidance uh, from the Environmental Protection a Agency that was passed after a PLF Supreme Court case, uh, Rapanos versus EPA. Um, that d tries to define what the jurisdiction of the EPA is over waters of the United States. That was um, the Rapanos. That was the famous 441 decision where Kennedy wrote the uh, uh, concurring but disagreeing opinion, uh, voting for the result, but saying that uh, you got to come, basically, got to come back to the Supreme Court on every single uh, case because it's on a, a fact based, case by case basis. Moment. Correct. And so the EPA, after that case, uh, basically, um, they, they, pa they issued a guidance document. Uh, to, for all of the the officials within the EPA, that uh, said that they that all of the officials should use the Kennedy um, decision and no, is, is that the famous it. WOTUS rule? Um, yeah, well, there there are two WOTUS rules. That is one uh, aspect of it. Um, the most recent WOTUS rule um, basically defined any any water uh, in in the United States, small as a pond, as waters of the United States, um, when it's traditionally been understood as navigable waters. Um, and that affects the jurisdiction of federal and state governments. And the EPA has well, used, and, and the federal government. Yeah, and the federal government, importantly, because so they're, they're basically taking jurisdiction of all, pretty much all, you know, 99% of all land by doing that. Yes, yeah, and then they, before you do anything that might impact even a small pond on, on your property, you would have to go and get various permits from the, the EPA. And again, at, at what kind of cost? Uh, well, it, I, I know that um, the the cost for failing to comply can be tens of thousands of dollars a day. Uh, with if you are if you build something and you have not gotten a permit, mm -hmm. and, and and that is um, and so that is the type of things that again I think that the federal government doesn't understand that uh, the the state and local governments have their own regulatory scheme and, and are better situated to know the situations of, of, of local, um, of their local citizens. And, of course, and some, some states are going to be worse than the federal government. California is a good example. <laughs> and that, that's true. Um, but I, I, for me personally, I've always felt that at least um, for, for if you're, your state and local governments, you at least have more influence uh, than your, the leaders at the, the, the federal level. Well, if, if it's a small state. Yeah, and yes. Some of these just seem cruel, though, like the Social Security one you mentioned. So someone, you know, can't do their own finances, so they need need help, and Social Security basically flags them and says, now we're going to use this in the background check databases and say you can't purchase a firearm. It just seems unnecessary. Yeah, and then the so that sounds like a literacy test for owning firearms. <laughs> basically. Well, and and it has been used for, uh, especially for for some with mental disabilities. Um, the ACLU. Uh, spoke out against this regulation. Um, and so the, I, I do think there was some, from, from many different political spectrums, uh, there was some support for overturning uh, this regulation. And, and it has, the, because, thanks to the Congressional Review Act, it has been. It's very exciting legislation. I mean, just generally, these bureaucracies run amok. I mean, remember a few years ago when the, the Library of Congress 
unilaterally decided that we can't unlock our phones that we buy from Verizon <laughs> and other carriers. And uh, Congress was like, what are, you, what are you doing? And they had to actually pass legislation and get Obama to sign. Now, that was a good example where Obama did sign legislation to undo a bureaucratic rule. But as you mentioned previously, the only time uh, Commercial uh, Review Act has been used was uh, right after Clinton. And they, they tried several times under Obama, but understandably so, he vetoed it. Right. And, and yeah, and I know that the American Action uh, Forum, uh, they put out a, a study today that they estimate that um, there has been $86 billion worth of savings as a result of these 13 re regulations that have been rolled back. 13, uh, what, on an annualized basis? Or? Uh, yes, on an annualized basis. Uh, wow. Okay, so, so the uh, EPA regulations are, uh, Waters of the United States type of regulations are next on the, on the uh, target list. What else? Um, a, another one is that, um, again, relating to public lands, um, in 2015, uh, the Bureau of Land Management and the Forest Service um, passed a few rules um, to, to purportedly uh, to protect the sage grouse, um, which is a small bird that is not endangered, and you can actually hunt it. But um, in order to protect this bird, uh, they passed um, many different regulations um, preventing uh, or preventing or curtailing uh, uh, mining, uh, natural gas development, ranching, uh, timber production on public lands. Um, and, and again, they, they pass these rules uh, affecting h how y one can use the public lands, but it, um, they never sent this rule to Congress. Was that a Fish and Wildlife rule or an EPA rule? Uh, it, was a, it was a Bureau of Land Management rule. And, okay. um, and a for there was a couple of rules, um, some from the Bureau of Land Management, some from the Forest Service. So even though there was no endangerment finding, they were saying we need to protect the species because we, we, we like the color of their feathers or something? Uh, yeah, well, yes, they, they do. They, they felt that it was an important part of the ecosystem, but again, it's not endangered. Um, and, and importantly, um, ranchers especially uh, have been working with their state and local governments um, to, to ensure that, uh, that this, this species does not die out. Because they like to hunt them. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, there is some incentive for that. Um, they also, I, I, ranchers know, <laughs> ranchers don't want to unnecessarily kill the, these birds. And, uh, and so they've worked with, with local governments. But again, the federal government um, has come in and um, decided that, that their way was the only way. Uh, but again, they did not send this rule, these rules to Congress, and they remain susceptible to the Congressional Review Act. Now, I'm curious, do you expect the uh, federal agencies to push the line on the substan substantially similar language, saying, you know, you're not supposed to just redo the same rule with a slight tweak? Do you expect them to try to do that anyway? Well, yeah, and so one of the, 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 the important aspects of the Congressional Review Act is that um, once a resolution of disapproval has been passed and signed by the president, the agency can no longer pass a substantially similar rule. And to your point, um, Future administrations will probably try and push that line, and um, it will be up to uh, to litigants to ensure that they comply with the law. So this will be in the courts for some time to come. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Speaking of uh, in the courts, you've been doing a few uh, amicus briefs. One is Bay Point Properties in Mississippi. Uh, if, am I understanding this correctly? Uh, a, a landowner was offered offered five hundred dollars in just compensation for land that was assessed at eight million is that the, is that the crux of it uh that is the crux of it uh he was uh, the the company was awarded five hundred dollars even though it was a previously assessed at, at eight million dollars so what happened was um previously uh the property owner's uh, predecessor had granted a a highway easement um across their land uh, but after hurricane katrina um unfortunately the the, the bridge was destroyed, and so the Mississippi Transportation Commission moved the bridge um, to another piece of land, and um, and so he's, but the Mississippi Transportation, despite not building a bridge, wanted to build a park on his land. Um, they tried to negotiate, and he went and got it assessed and said that the value of the land would be $8 million. Um, the Mississippi Transportation Commission uh, in, instead decided that they would not uh, pay for that, um, and just decided to build the park anyway. And he, he sued, uh, filed a, an inverse condemnation um, suit, and there was, a, uh, and there, the legislator had passed a law that, based, that said that if the Mississippi Transportation Commission had not formally abandoned the easement um, at a meeting, that the land has to be treated as though the, the, the easement is still there. 
uh, despite the fact that there's no bridge there anymore. Was that law passed before or after this dispute? It, it was passed before. Um, based on that, based on that uh, law, the judge instructed the jury to award no more than five hundred dollars. Okay, so the easement was in existence before. Uh, and, and had been paid for before? Or? Yeah, it had been paid for, um, but I, uh, traditionally, uh, when um, an easement is abandoned, um, no longer used, uh, the the um, the all of the the full title of the land goes back to the underlying property. Okay, so the, so it kind of hangs on a technicality as to, as to whether or not they'd formally abandoned the easement. Well, yes, and at common law, um, I, I think, but ultimately. Um, all these facts were presented in front of um, a jury, mm -hmm. and and under the Constitution, the Just Compensation Clause, it's up to the trier of fact to to take into all these facts mm -hmm. um, and and determine what just compensation was. The problem here is that that based on these laws, the the court instructed the jury that five hundred dollars was the max, um, when really the ultimately the jury should be um, under the Constitution. The jury should decide what the just compensation was based on on all of this information. Um, and so now the Bay Point. So, so, so the legal argument is whether the jury should decide or the judge should decide. Well, or the, and in this case, legislator, because the legislator said, we're going to treat this, we're going to value this, and obviously the value is going to be a little bit different property. But the, the, the legislator set the, uh, the terms of the valuation, and, and under our Constitution, the just compensation, the terms are determined by. Uh, in this case, the jury or, or the trier of fact, um, and and now that the, the uh, Bay Point Properties has asked the Supreme Court, to, the U.S. Supreme Court, to review the case, uh, Pacific Legal Foundation has filed a brief in support of that petition. So they lost. Bay Point lost at the appellate level. Yes, at the at the Mississippi Supreme Court. Okay, Mississippi U.S. or State Supreme Court. Yeah, Mississippi State Supreme. Court. Okay, so not, it's not on appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court. Yes. Okay, Gunderson versus Indiana. Uh, I understand that uh, the state of Indiana has uh, decided that uh, Lake Michigan is a tidal body of water. Is that uh, why they're uh, being able to uh, figure out where a high water mark and a low water mark are for the purpose of uh, grabbing a little bit of shoreline? Yeah, so yeah, there's a dispute. Um, this is a, a, a case that, that some uh, landowners that live um, near the shore of Lake Michigan in Indiana um, have they have asked the Indiana Supreme Court to hear their case. Um, the dispute comes about um, at common law, um, the the lands underneath um, water be belong to the state, um, and so what some states have decided is that that means uh, any land that the water has ever touched, um, even farther than whatever the land water has has ever touched, um, on on coastal lands. Um, on, with tidal lands, usually how it goes is they'll, they'll, the state will say that they have the property up to the high water mark. Now, in Indiana, um, Lake Michigan is not a tidal body of water. And so. So the water line is the water line is the water line, and it doesn't change. Right, um, except that. Um, unless, some unless, you state, high, unless you get a high wind. Yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> some state officials, though, decided that they were going to set the high water mark um, at. Arbitrarily. Ar arbitrarily. Um, and so this is actually both sides uh, won and lost at the uh, won some issues, lost some issues at the Court of Appeal. Um, the Court of Appeal, to their credit, rejected the arbitrarily set high water mark line, um, but they did leave a vague um, they did leave a, a vague statement about what the high water mark is. Um, it should be as as we discussed. I mean, the high wa water mark is the high water mark in, in Lake Michigan, but the way that they described it was anywhere where the water has had some effect. Um, on, on the sand, which, again, is pretty vague, and so the subject um, to very windy days. Yeah, so Pacific Legal Foundation has has filed a, an amicus brief on behalf of um, some other property owners um, in the area, and on behalf of Pacific Legal Foundation, um, supporting the, um, the 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 request for the Indiana Supreme Court to hear the case um, because one, uh, at, at the very least, property interests need to be clearly defined um, to, to put expectations in clear. And right now... And if the state wants to take a few more yards of beach print property, they should pay for them. Yes, and, and, and uh, like I said, it, it, traditionally, um, it, it is what is, at common law is called the public trust doctrine, which essentially said the state um, has the un underlying, the land underlying water, the land underlying the water to, uh, for navigation, uh, 
purposes and navigation and commerce purposes. Um, but other states have expanded this um, to include recreation, and they've expanded it to even land that abuts the water rather than land that's un under the water or even land that um, is above the high water mark um, on tidal lands. And so um, one thing that Pacific Legal Foundation has asked the Indiana Supreme Court is to take the case to clearly define um, and, and to respect the common law because if they're trying to take more land above above the water, um, then they do have to compensate. And you mentioned you had several plaintiffs. How widespread would you say this is? Like how often is the government using this rule? Well, in Indiana, uh, Lake Michigan, I think, is only about uh, 50 miles in Indiana. Um, so th there's not a lot of land in Indiana, but um, this has been, um, well, this has been an issue in any, uh, in any coastal area, um, so both on the, on the east and, um, and the west coasts of the United States. Um, and then other, um, and another, another Great Lakes states. Yeah, another Great Lakes states. And, and the, the question, is, and it's an ongoing question about how to define what exactly um, the the public uh, can use, and what, and most importantly, uh, what the state would have to do, ha what private property owners have, and who needs to be compensated um, if they if the gov if the state government's trying to take more land. Now, now, Jeff, you came to PLF from five years at Mountain States Legal Foundation. And before that, you did uh, and had an interesting uh, uh, job uh, as an intern for Neil Gorsuch, as well as took a couple of uh, college classes from him, right? Yes, yeah. I just I just moved to Sacramento in, in February. Um, I'm an attorney in Colorado, not yet an attorney in California. Um, but yes, uh, before that, while I was a, a law student at the University of Colorado, um, I uh, Neil Gorsuch was um, now Justice Gorsuch was a, a uh, an adjunct professor um, at the at the University of Colorado Law School. Um, I took a class from him, met him there, and then was able, had the honor of working for him in his chambers as an intern uh, for a semester, um, where I got to um, work on some of, the, some of the cases at the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals um, and work with his, his law clerks at the time. Um, and I, so I was able to, to work under him, and he, it, it was exciting to see on a personal level to see him um, be appointed to the US, United States Supreme Court. Um, I think, uh, watching his confirmation hearings, uh, I think that the, his public persona was uh, was no different than what I saw um, working for him, both as a professor and as a judge. Um, he is he is tough but fair, um, and during his confirmation hearings, uh, he he made a lot of statements about um, about respect for the law, uh, about respect for the the, the litigants, um, and and ensuring that um, your, a judge's personal opinions. Uh, don't affect their analysis of the law. And I think his writings um, reflect that. Um, I, I, everybody has disagreements. I'm sure that um, uh, there will be people who agree, agree and disagree with his decisions, but I do think that his approach to the law and what he said during his confirmation about his approach to the law, um, I can only speak for what I saw, but I think it, it reflects uh, very well on him, and I think it reflects his approach that I saw while he was on the 10th Circuit. Court. Reason Magazine just came out with an article calling him more liberal uh, on, than, than Merrick Garland, Garland, particularly on issues of, of interest to, liber uh, to libertarians. Would that be uh, accurate, do you think? Well, uh, I, I think one of his In particular, regarding administrative law Chevron doctrine kind of stuff. Yes, and, and he, he just, uh, he wrote uh, an opinion in an immigration case that actually went against um, the, the, um, the decision of, of the the Department of Justice um, in trying to deport um, an immigrant. And I think that's because, um, again, um, talking about Chevron um, and talking about deference to agency officials, he, he was very reluctant to do that. And so I think, um, and one of the concerns from, uh, from the Democrats was whether or not Justice Gorsuch would, would be feel comfortable uh, going against President Trump. But I think um, based on, on the, on his past cases, uh, he's never had a problem going against the administration um, if that's where the law leads him. And and yes, I, I think um, while uh, uh, Merrick Garland has had a, a long career, um, he has had some cases where he, he sides with the government, defers, uh, defers with the, the agencies. And so I, I do think it is a, um, a real question about who would be more liberal, um, especially on, on issues of, that are um, of interest to libertarians. Yeah, what I'm particularly excited about is his stance on uh, being 
particular in ensuring that all the elements of a crime are met before convicting someone. Uh, I read some case of, about uh, cannabinoids where he decided for the defendant. Also, I believe uh, he has some good cases on the Fourth Amendment. Do you think he's going to be strong on the Fourth Amendment? Well, I, I, I think so. I've been, as you mentioned, and I think that's because he looks really at what the law says. And so if there's a criminal law and, and that Congress or a legislator writes a law that says these are the elements of the crime, well, then those are the elements that have to be met. And, and again, so I think this was the same way as the late Justice Scalia um, most people are surprised to hear that he was very good on, on criminal procedure matters as well. Because that, br that brings up an interesting question. This is my last question. Uh, in Arizona, there's a, some monkey wrenching going on <laughs> as far as speed cameras are concerned, which is that people uh, use speed cameras, take a, take your picture, and you can take a picture of your person as well as the car and the license plate and so forth, and they say they automatically manage to get a ticket. Uh, so people have decided to uh, to monkey wrench those things by. Well, by p taking a pickaxe to the camera or putting tape over them or silly putty. But one of the other things that people are doing is they're dressing up with monkey uh, masks and giraffe masks so that they, they can't personally be identified when the speed camera takes their picture. Is that something that Gorsuch is going to decide, uh, decide with the defendant on if it ever makes it to, uh, to the high court? I, I can't say whether, <laughs> whether or not, but it is a, an interesting strategy. Um, I, for civil disobedience. Um, I, I don't know if you have any thoughts on, on how this is, whether you think this is a good idea or is successful. I mean, I, I think it's a good idea. I don't think anyone wants to be uh, arrested because a robot caught them doing something. I think, um, generally speaking, the idea that we can just be, t have pictures taken of us for driving too fast without any other conditions, like maybe we're, we're driving recklessly and too fast, I think is a problem. Uh, for example, there's about a dozen states that have secondary seatbelt laws, which means that you can't be pulled over for not wearing a seatbelt unless you're committing some other offense. I'm kind of in the camp that just speeding alone, if, if it's not also reckless, you probably shouldn't be pulled over, and these cameras are certainly not able to evaluate that. Well, and I, I know that some, there's been some studies that red light cameras have actually made it more unsafe because people are more afraid. Um, and and slam on the brakes, yeah. increasing rear end collisions. Yes. And that's the show. We'll see you again next week. Same time, same place on the Libertarian Counterpoint. Uh, we're on the uh, uh, TV on Channel 17. We're on the web at www.accesssacramento.org. And of course, we're on uh, YouTube. Uh, and uh, the broadcast time is 8 p.m. Thursday, uh, noon on Friday, 4 a.m. on Saturday. Thank you very much, uh, Jeff McCoy and uh, uh, Gerald Cliff, for being a part of the show this evening. We'll see you again uh, sometime in the near future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.